Well, as I said at the outset, I'm not going to talk about my detailed empirical work on power. It's in plenty available in various books. And it reaches a conclusion that many of you may now share due to events of the last 30 years, including the Reagan years. Namely, that the owners and managers of large banks, corporations, and associated law firms, foundations, and policy groups dominate the economic and political realms in the United States. So instead of talking about that research, I want to talk about the corporate rich in politics in the 90s and about what those interested in more equality and social justice might do. And in the process, I will explain why the corporate rich have been and are so powerful in the United States and why there's a small possibility that that could change. Due simply to the massive power shift in the southern United States that is known as the Civil Rights Movement. Now I'm going to frame my final remarks here around a series of questions. I will ask and answer uh, a question that I think leads logically, well, at least naturally, or at least sort of in my mind, it leads to a next question. In other words, you may say, this is a leap that this person has made. And so on like that until I have explained all of a recent American history, <laughs> the failures of the labor movement, and the reason why third parties turn out so badly. Also, how to help Clinton in 94 and 96 if you so desire, and how to challenge Clinton in 96 if you have an even bigger desire. So my first question is this, what is going to be the key issue of the next 10 years? And the answer is another question. And that is, can our national economy produce decent jobs for the great majority of people without, without massive government deficits and or direct employment of people by government? And I think the answer is no. It takes huge government spending to make the American economy work. And when I say that, of course, I have flown in the face of what's currently the conventional wisdom, which is we must balance the budget and we must shrink government. I think in that direction lies madness. So uh, I put myself out there in a clear contrast to the going uh, statements. Why do I believe this? I think, aside from a little dose of Keynesianism, at a certain point in my training, I think the entire history of the United States since the great crash of 29, right down to the current revival of the Los Angeles economy through earthquake spending by Clinton and Wilson supports my view. You know, after that great crash of 1929, the economy just continued straight on down while everybody balanced the budget until finally government spending started in late 33 and in 34. And as the economy started up, in 37, 38, FDR decided to balance the budget. He didn't believe that Keynesian stuff. He didn't quite believe his Keynesian advisor. And so he balanced the budget. And bang, the economy went right straight down. It was like couldn't have been a, a better empirical test. Well, along came World War II spending, and that, of course, is what saved the American economy. And it was a brilliant demonstration that uh, this economy can be made to run incredibly well um, in those Keynesian kinds of ways. And indeed, if the economy had, been, had price controls and the you know, been run just the way it was, there could have been two, two airplanes in every garage, as, uh, let alone uh, two cars. Well, from 1945 to 49, it wasn't government spending, I think, that kept the economy going. It was pent-up consumer demand from the war years when people couldn't spend as much and when there was price control, there was nothing to buy, relatively speaking. But from 1950 on, it has been, in my view, defense spending. Uh, that has carried the economy, including Reagan's incredible military Keynesianism of the 1980s, which I think is the most amazing thing for a pre-Keynesian to run this totally Keynesian uh, recovery, all the while bad-mouthing deficits and all the while, of course, bad-mouthing uh, governments, and, and yet getting this uh, glorious Keynesian set of years. Well, if you're still in denial on what I'm saying, consider the California economy in the face of base closings and defense cuts, particularly Southern California, to be saved only, and now it may be saving us even on this campus, the budget may be stabilizes, to be saved only by the fact that Clinton rushed in with money, earthquake insurance rushed in, and Sacramento, uh, uh, Pete Wilson began building those freeways like crazy down there. Now, Pete Wilson may be a conservative and he may not be a Keynesian, but as one of my colleagues would say, he ain't no fool. And that means Pete Wilson is down there pumping that economy like crazy. Uh, and he's got an excuse, there was an earthquake. Well look, if that's the case, if I'm right, why don't we just admit it? Why don't we admit that we need and, and have government spending? Well the first level answer to that question is that we as a nation have an anti-government ideology. We pay the lowest taxes of Western capitalist countries 
And the government has built key infrastructure throughout our history everywhere, especially in the deserts of Arizona and Southern California. But people hate taxes and government nonetheless. And I think the more they are dependent on government, like in Southern California and Arizona, the more they hate it. Well, why are we then anti-government in our ideology? I think it's because the beliefs and interests of capitalists are so powerful in America. That is, anti-government and individualistic ideology reflect capitalist power. Capitalists have two needs that create a dilemma for them and for the society. They often deal with one horn of the dilemma and then the other horn at different points in time. But I think when it comes down to choosing, they have no hesitation which horn they choose. And that's the one I'm going to talk about first. And it's the one that uh, talks about power and the maintenance of the system. First, and I think most importantly for capitalists, bottom line, is they need to control labor markets. That is, they need to keep, they believe, labor cheap. They need to be able to hire and fire at will. They need to keep work rules flexible. They don't like, if you haven't heard, unions. Secondly, capitalists need to sell their stuff, their goods and services, which means they need consumers, which creates a problem because workers that aren't paid very much are often not, often, are always not very good uh, consumers. I think if we look at those two dilemmas, that in that context we can understand many things. One of which is that government is intensely disliked because it's a threat to control of labor markets. It's government that might help unions, as it did in the USA in the 30s and the 40s, a tiny bit. Uh, but for reasons that I really don't have time to talk about in terms of, of talking about historical uh, kinds of, of factors. The other thing I think this helps explain is why we have welfare and not, um, and not direct employment by government. It's not liberals that want welfare, it's conservatives that want welfare because conservatives would rather have welfare than have uh, the government employ uh, workers. Now, I want to finally turn to the uh, question that's in the title of my talk. Why are the corporate rich, the corporate capitalists in America so powerful? What I mean by so powerful, that was kind of a rhetorical title, I gotta talk about that. I mean more powerful than elsewhere in other advanced capitalist countries, and that's indexed by uh, the low union density, the low percentage of people in unions, by a weak welfare state for the poor, by huge wealth and income disparities, by the huge amount of capitalists directly involved in our government. This question used to be framed as, why is there not a strong socialist or social democratic party uh, in the USA? After all, even in Canada, the social democrats sometimes get 15 or 20 percent of the vote. What is unique about the USA? I think the most general answer to that question is that the capitalists in the USA are slightly less disorganized than the rest of us. Well, what I'm trying to say is that I'm not saying the capitalists are so super organized that it's unbelievably clever and, and so on and so forth. What I am saying to you, though, is that social organization is always based in some form of, social power is always based in some form of organization. And basically, in the United States, there have been no counter organizations uh, to the business uh, uh, community. We don't have one big church, which was true in many uh, countries in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we don't have huge standing armies historically. We did not have huge, huge government bureaucracies as some, as the surviving European countries did as they fought with each other over the years. So there were no strong rivals to the uh, big business people in the United States, and hence their view of the world is the, review, is the view that dominates, because there's no organization that can develop a counter view. Well, in a sense, what I've just said, though, about churches and military and government is too abstract for what I want to talk about. The point is that labor is less organized in the United States than anywhere else, and that's what makes the corporate rich so powerful that labor is less organized. So why is labor less organized in the United States? And the answers are two intertwined answers that uh, I don't think most people uh, would agree with me on. And that's why, of course, I want to talk about uh, here tonight. I don't think the analysis that most people have put forward is deep enough. I'm being critical then of, of many fellow social scientists. I think there's two interacting factors. First of all is the, the history of the southern United States. And the second is that we elect a president instead of a parliament. Now let me go back to those. I don't think you can ever underestimate for one second the importance of the political economy of the southern United States in understanding every bit of American history 
and everything that's happening right this very day. The fact of slavery, the fact of 100 years of Jim Crow, the fact that essentially the working people of the southern United States were powerless, politically powerless and otherwise too, but politically powerless for my point here, until 1965 is a tremendous explanatory factor about this country because it means the working people were divided right from the start into slave and free, into black and white, into agricultural workers and industrial and other kinds of, of workers in the North. But that in itself, I don't think would have been necessarily telling if it had not been for the fact that there was no way to develop an organization to overcome this. And that gets to this business about a presidential system. But the point is that in a presidential system like ours, where you also elect governors and people from districts, it creates a series of what are called winner-take-all elections. So in that situation, to vote for a third party of, your, of the left is a, is a vote for the right. It's a vote for what used to be called your worst enemy, but you know, I'm a benign sort, so I say your least favored choice. To vote for a third party of the left in California is to elect Pete Wilson. Um, to vote for a third party at the national level, that elects Goldwaters and so on, if you do it. And every time radicals have done that, of course, the liberals have hated them for it, and the battle has been between the liberals and the, the radicals, uh, trying to get the, radical, the voters the radicals would take back into the Democratic Party. The point is that workers could not create a third party, as they could in these parliamentary countries, to develop a program and a consciousness that was uh, any way counter uh, to the capitalists. Because you see in the United States the Democrats are not the party of the common man, they are the party of the southern rich. They are the party of the slaveholding plantation elites. Uh, and I believe that was uh, true essentially till 1965 and it uh, still is. Now I recognize in the 30s that liberals and labor came to be more important than the Democratic Party. But no matter to the southerners, they just formed into what was called the conservative coalition with the northern Republicans. And on any class issue, and here I'm really uh, generalizing from a lot of literature and political science where they've studied the voting patterns in Congress. Any issue that has to do with class, which includes civil rights issues, because that's really a class issue in the South, because it has to do with whether black people are going to have any economic and political clout. So a civil rights issue is a class issue. And of course on those issues, the Northern Republicans and the Southern Democrats voted uh, together and kept anything from happening until there was a massive civil rights movement, which was so strong that the Northern Republicans broke that one time with the Southern Democrats and made it possible for these voting rights and civil rights acts to pass. And I'd furthermore say to you this conservative coalition still rules America. Uh, there are, the Congress of the United States is run by conservatives. I don't care what their label is. Sam Nunn is a conservative. Uh, there are 55 or so conservative in that Senate, the 40-some Republicans and 10 or 12 Southern Democrats. The same thing is true uh, in the House. Now, and the point then be becomes, you see, that since there's no party, uh, no place for the workers to go into the Democratic Party. They're constantly trapped in trying to um, uh, get any organization. In this context, the workers could not create strong unions. They did not have a party to help them. And furthermore, and this is the next point, companies, companies that are organized in the North, they just go south. They just move to the southern United States to escape the unionization. And now, of course, we know they move overseas uh, since the mid-70s, which has further weakened uh, the, the labor movement. Well, the point is, what's the big picture? There's no organizational base that could be built to create programs that could create consciousness that would counter an individualistic ideology. So we all have this capitalist individualistic ideology because all the going institutions in our society totally uh, reflect, work on that per pic picture, that principle. Well, that's the big picture of conservative rule in the United States. Is there any possibility of change? And the answer is maybe. Because there have been a huge shift that I've mentioned. The civil rights movement of the 60s made a dramatic change. And I'm running out, I'm even running over my carefully timed talk with my apology. But the point I want to make to you is, without detracting in the slightest or by failing to mention the, many of the, the important changes of the civil rights movement, the important thing I want to em emphasize here is voting rights. Because what that did was, and the whole victory of, of African Americans in the South, what it did was to make the Democratic Party no longer useful or, or of interest to these Southern whites elites. So they began to drift away. But they didn't just drift away, they were driven out. They were driven out by black voters. Gradually, black voters, as they came into those primaries, 
moved the conservatives into uh, the Republican Party. And of course, the other whites went with the elites uh, on racial and religious kinds of grounds. All the attacks were made on the Democrats as the party against family and for homosexuality and against guns. And you know, the whole business, which is why we always see a picture of Clinton holding his gun in one hand and his Bible in the other and, you know, and downplaying every possible kind of social issue uh, that would upset uh, Southern uh, whites. The point is this, for the first time in American history, in my belief, first time in American history, it's now possible to have a center-left coalition run the government in the United States. First time. Never before possible. What's that mean? It means a Democrat in the White House, so there's no veto. It means 60 votes in the Senate to get rid of a filibuster, and up and, uh, until recently it took 67 votes to stop a filibuster. And it means that just a majority, just a majority in the House of Representatives. In the past, there was not only a conservative coalition, but there were all these hurdles that the conservatives had built into the House, uh, including the House Rules Committee. So you could have everybody on your side, and if the Southerners had the House Rules Committee, you were screwed. Uh, no more. Majority in the House, 60 votes in the Senate, a Democrat in the White House, and you could get a little bit of change. In other words, it's now possible to use the Democratic Party, especially its primaries, as an organizational basis to challenge the anti-government, anti-spending ideology of Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Ross Perot, and Leon Panetta. I'm trying to give you a sense of just how far to the left I'm moving here. Leon, Leon's a wonderful guy. He's our former representative. And what is he doing? He's trying to balance the budget. Uh, you know, I just don't think it, it washes. That is, but I want to put it more specifically, I think it's possible now to forge black-white alliances in the southern United States to challenge the Democratic primaries against the people who stopped Clinton. Well, that's not going to be easy to challenge in those Democratic primaries. There's such a long history of, of racism, there's misunderstanding, all the social issues between uh, blacks and whites. But I want to point out to you the CIO was integrated, and that parts of the Democratic Party are integrated. The goal has to be, if I may slip into the role of consultant, uh, unpaid and unasked for, no longer analyzing, but just a mere consultant. The goal has to be to out Clinton, Clinton, as far as stressing the economy. And indeed, if people continue to feel undercut in the economy, it would make sense to me for liberal and progressive Democrats to challenge Clinton in the 1996 primaries, because he's not going to get any other challengers, especially in California, strictly on economic issues, strictly on government spending and saying, this government must spend money and we must have the government employ people and the government is not all bad. That is, it will, it will also be, though, necessary to out Clinton Clinton by neutralizing all divisive social issues. And that's hard. And that's hard for a lot of reasons, because people want to finish their issues, uh, but also some of the issues won't, um, won't uh, submerge easily, even if you tried to. So what I'm doing is suggesting what activists should do, and I want to close with that here tonight. Uh, I got three points to make. One is, it's absolutely essential to emphasize values, not social class. And that may sound like a paradox, especially coming from me, because I do believe that this is a class-riven society. I do believe that the way to understand our society is around the issue of class conflict. But I also believe politically it makes no sense to talk about class in the United States. Americans despise the idea of class. They came from Europe to get away from class. When you interview them as sociologists, they say class is what's in Europe. We're getting rid of class. There's less class than there ever was in the United States. Uh, and they mean it in a social sense, not in the economic sense I mean it. But nonetheless, to try to go out and raise people's class consciousness is kind of going right into the face of, of what they want to believe. Secondly, if we get into class, we have to get into everybody's class origins. And what is wrong with a person that's well-to-do that decides they want equality? But if you're looking at, at class all the time, then you're, they have to apologize for where they were from. And that gets to the third point. It really is values that matter anyhow. And I think that's one of the contributions that social psychologists have made, of many. Uh, a lot of work showing if you have a choice between being with a person of your own race with different values or a person of a different uh, race with the same values and so on with gender, your tendency is to go with the people with the same values. Now, that research is in small groups. It does not mean that suddenly the history of the United States is washed away or institutional structures that are racist are washed away. But the point is that values do matter. And here I give you also Martin Luther King Jr. His point was building on Christianity, there is redemption. You can change your values. And if your values change, you're part of us. So who cares what class you're from if you share 
the values that, uh, that our uh, group is putting uh, forward. And I think that's the super important point if there's not going to be division right from any start of a political movement in the United States. Well, closely related to that, any movement has got to emphasize coalitions, not identity politics. <clears throat> the story of the United States, from a left point of view in the 70s and 80s, is what is called identity politics, where people put an emphasis on the specific identity that they, one specific one of their identities, and the hurts within it, whether it be male and female, or black, brown, white, whether it be gay and straight, or many others. And indeed, that started, the very thing started with, with what really started the weakness of the movement of the 60s, when there was a black-white uh, kind of, of split in the mid-60s. Now, maybe all of that was a necessary phase. Uh, I'm not disputing that. But the point is, it did split the progressive coalition in a million different ways. And as Hardy Fry once said, one of the many things that was great about the anti-apartheid movement, aside from we believed in it, was he said, you can get all the groups back in the same room again without them killing each other. In other words, everybody could be anti-apartheid, but if they get in a room to say, what ought to be our agenda here in the United States, everybody would say, mine, no, mine, and then, and then the tension uh, would begin. And that's been going on for a long time. Final point I'd make under this is that I think it's essential to understand, again from social psychology, the different roles of what we call radicals and liberals. Radicals are the people that stand outside the system, that criticize the system. They are, in effect, exemplars. They often break the laws. Now, they're unjust laws in their mind. Martin Luther King and others broke laws. But the people who break laws, the paradox is that they must renounce any quest for their own power, or they have the danger of becoming a manipulative uh, and elitist. Their role has to be to try to get others in power, not themselves. Liberals are those who are inside the system trying to change it. Uh, they are those that uh, should be in politics. Liberals and radicals usually don't get along at all. But I don't think the liberals could have survived or changed much if there weren't radicals yelling outside. On the other hand, you can yell outside the, 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 the fortress all you want. If there's nobody in there that's willing to make the changes, uh, it's not going to work. Well, what I've said then in conclusion uh, is a paradoxical kind of thing. I have said something that uh, most mainstream social scientists may not agree with, namely we have this class system that's dominated by the corporate rich, but contrary to those who might agree with me on that analysis, I have said something that mainstream social scientists and others may agree with about politics. In other words, I have said heretical things about uh, politics from the point of view of a, of a radical. And to summarize those, I've said forget class politics and forget class consciousness. Downplay the uh, identity politics of the last 15 years. Don't hate liberals. And don't try to start a third party. <laughs> well, I'm now at my conclusion to the second half of my talk. I do not know, of course, if the Democratic Party will be changed in the South or whether its primaries will be used to challenge the Clintonites in 96. But I do think I know that it's now possible when it was not possible before the Civil Rights Movement made black voting and black politics possible and hence black-white working-class politics possible. What I know is that there is at least the possibility of a new day in American politics despite the globalization of production and the decline of industrial unions. The South has changed at the power level, the Cold War is over, and we may be at the point where progressives and liberals will decide that economic issues should be emphasized again, both because of the gains the identity groups have made on recognition issues and also because of the common problem everybody may share with jobs if Wilson and Clinton don't find excuses to pump the economy without being Keynesians, of course. But if I had to bet, I'd have to bet on more of the same. I'd have to bet on, as a power analyst, on increasing poverty and despair, and gradual growth at the lower economic levels, increasing squeeze at the middle levels. That would be my bet. But I cannot close on that note because of the following. Nobody foresaw the New Deal. Nobody foresaw the flowering of the civil rights movement into a massive uh, struggle. And nobody foresaw the rise of Gorbachev and the relatively peaceful transma transformation of the Soviet Empire. And I'm drawing it around the Soviet Empire. I think we know many things in the uh, social sciences. And I think historians know many things as well. And I think history teaches us uh, many lessons. And two of the things that I think social scientists and historians know is that things do change. And secondly, no one can predict the future. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.